haven't forgot old old Pete or Uncle Pete as I usually hear him referred to. Uh, thank the cousins especially, you know. And uh, you know today we're thinking a lot about Uncle Pete Lapp. And so there's a lot being said about him. So I thought maybe I'd mix it up. Let's talk about Wyatt Earp. <laughs> now, October 26, 1881. Okay, Corral. Imagine the scene. Those square front buildings with the advertising up on top like they had in the good old days, the boardwalks. Dusty. Road apple filled roads, flies. Here comes Wyatt Earp and his brother walking down the road. Right there with uh, uh, Doc Holliday. Oh, carrying 10 gauge shotgun, 45 uh, single action revolvers, all powered with black powder. And that event, when it was finished, not a single bullet found Wyatt Earp. Number of people died that day, Wyatt Earp was untouched. Wyatt Earp would not die till January 13th of 1929. Now think about that scene. No, 1929, paved streets, cement sidewalks, uh, cement buildings, Gangsters driving down those paved roads in their flivers, sitting next to the gun malls who are, who are flappers, smoking cigarettes and chewing bubble gum. <laughs> They're shooting 40, Thompson 45 semi-automatic, or Thompson 45 automatic rifles up to the top of their windows along the 45 automatic pistols. Wyatt Earp and that scene put them together. They don't fit. Now that Wyatt Earp, when he thought about who am I, was he thinking about 1929? He was back in the OK Corral. It was 1881, maybe 1891, but it wasn't where he died. And it kind of points to something that happens to those of us who are lucky enough to die at an advanced age, is though we need to learn and we need to hold on to the things from the past. We need to build from our experience. We are always going to be challenged to live in here and now. Now, Wyatt Earp, what was his, uh, what, what were his uh, last words, famous last words? Oh my it, God. <laughs> His last words were, suppose, suppose, and we don't know what the suppose is about. Those were his last two words. That's one thing with last words, is when you have last words and you screw it up the first time, you can't go back and fix it. <laughs> and that was the case with Wyatt So, you're... Today is Pete's day, and you're probably going to ask me, well, I wonder what Pete's last words were. Well, I can tell you, folks, I was in that room when he spoke his last words. So was Loretta. Pete Latin's last words, and I quote, I gotta pee. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose, suppose, but pretty good, don't you? <laughs> and of course, Paul doesn't have a chance to fix that. So, but no, I think uh, most of us don't remember Pete so much as he was at the end, as as we experienced a lot of the last three years. The way people tend to remember him is from the camping years. You know, uh, one of one of my favorite memories of him in camping years was that great big flying pan. I don't know how many of you are in on that great big frying pan. I remember seeing that camp or that, that big frying pan on top of one of those National Forest Service little cement doodads out there cooking away and have a camp robber try to come in and steal that bacon. <laughs> that was the most bravest thing I've ever seen in my life. That was, there was nothing but hot coming out of that frying pan. He would 
Get up on top, he flutter and fluff like he thought he was a hummingbird. Down he coming and yeah, yeah. <laughs> he missed it by that much. <laughs> but that, that was that was his thing. Anyway, that those are the years that we remember, Paul, a lot of us, the most most favorably and and and, and, uh, and the most well. Out there with Evelyn at Jumping Creek, uh, Monarch, playing whist <laughs> on those camp tables by Coleman light, Coleman lantern light, when it's surrounded by a cloud of millers who are selectively dying as they will and falling down around the, the uh, Coleman lantern as people continue to play whist and get sick of it and go back to bed. Uh, that's one thing they say about uh, uh, bad roads, is when you find bad roads, in which we were on all the time when we're out camping, Bad roads tends to equal good people and good times. And that's what we had. Um, we kind of prefer those memories. Now, I have some memories of Paul, nobody else probably does, being his son and the one and only Lonely Sprout. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember I have one of these people that has childhood memories. I don't remember everything by any mad stretch of the imagination, but I have these little flashes. I can go back, I can remember being an ambassador, mm -hmm. uh, but just by flashes. And I remember Pa come in, I was just a toddler, he'd come in with those pinstripe coveralls, and they always had diesel soaked in them. I didn't know what it was at the time, but that's what Dad smelled like. And I cannot smell diesel smoke cloth, or di diesel soaked cloth to this day without thinking of Dad. And those huge red wing boots. He always wore red wing boots. And I would sit down and I'd put one of these red wing boots between my legs and I'd pull the tongue back and just be absolutely amazed that one foot <laughs> of this, this mountain of flesh went into this boot. Uh, that, that was the thing, is, is that from that perspective, this is something I remember clearly and I, I, I have to wonder if it's not a larger larger thing to think about here is that I couldn't imagine him as being the same thing I was. You know, there were the dogs and there was Mom and Paul. And I had to be something closer to a dog than well, I, 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 huge. It's unthinkable I could ever be half that size, half that powerful. And when you really think about it, my mindset as a toddler, that guy in that white chair right there he was actually God. And I'm not speaking figuratively. I'm not speaking literally. I thought when the sun came up and the sun went down, Dad had something to do with it. He set it up. <laughs> I've seen him putting a fence around the yard, and I've seen him do all these incredible things. What could be more powerful than Dad? Well, in time, you know, eventually you learn, well, maybe Dad isn't God, you know? But I still have that in my head. Here recently, I found myself in the position of putting diapers on that guy and treating him as if he was a toddler of mine. And that kind of shows us, I think, that the, the high and the low are inclined together. I think I'm not the only one who had this experience. You know, the high and the low are indeed inclined together. And we need to remember that, that we're never so high or never so low. But there's something different. There's something more. Uh, another thing I want, I want to talk about, a little metaphysical, I suppose, is this thing that Dad was involved with, with dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, it's a lot, you know, when you're around it a lot, maybe you experience the same thing. It's a lot more like what the Indians had in the old days, with the, when they, they'd send the young braves out for a vision quest, or when the shaman would go out for a vision quest, and they would go out and starve themselves, or maybe, they, maybe they'd use peyote or sweet grass or whatever it was, but they were consulting the gods. What's going on? Inform me. Tell me these things I don't know. Show me my life in a different way. Explain to me what's going on. Give me the symbols. Give me, give me meaning. Well, Dad was like he was living in a vision quest. The unfortunate part for Dad was 
he didn't appreciate it as such. You know, when, when the warrior goes out, he is actively petitioning the gods. <clears throat> when the, the shaman would go out, he's actively petitioning the gods. Tell me. Dad is just sitting in his chair with his pinwheels watching prices right, and the gods, as it were, reach down and go, Pete, you're coming with me. Oh, man, what are you doing? So that was what Dad was confronting. He was, he was in this continuous vision quest. His mind and his environment was continually feeding, me his, feeding him his own life dis, in a disjointed fashion to teach him other things, perhaps the things he needs to know right now. Uh, I'll, I would like to share with you a few of the things that he, he did experience. Uh, just that I don't know if you can make sense of it, but I know there's a lot of it I can't make sense out of, but uh, they were very important to Dad just the same. One of them, he came out in the morning time. He just spent it up all night, it was a, a pretty good night. I didn't have to go in and deal with him much. He came out pushing silver and he said, that was the damnedest night. And well, what was, what happened, Paul? He says, I spent all night in Russ Miner's corral with Boyd Niver. <coughs> and all we did was talk. Oh, now this is good. Paul, what did they talk about? Well, that's the stupidest thing. I can't remember what happened. <laughs> but I would spend all night in that corral with Boyd and Ivor. And, and then, is there anything you can tell me about it, Paul, besides that? Well, I guess I could say to tell you that, that Boyd pretty much did all the talking. <laughs> Ivor was just over, you know, he would he, 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 nod up and down and he'd say, yep, or no, nope, or I don't know. But he didn't have much to say, but Boyd was said everything. So that was one of his, his adventures. Uh, it's the thing, it, with, with, with Dad, as opposed to any of us, walking with dead people means nothing. I mean, for me to talk to people, you have to be alive. Dad was, had no such strict constrictions on him. He, he would talk, he would mix it up, he'd put living people with dead people, and he put, you know, he just talk to dead people all the time. <clears throat> and people I never heard of, I don't know if they're living or dead or what, uh, anyway, another one of his adventures, this happened about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I come out and I see him, and he stepped, he stepped out of his bedroom, no walker, no nothing, standing on two legs, not holding on to anything, and he sees me with these bleary eyes, and bleary eyes, you always knew he was, he was having something going on, he had those bleary eyes, and he looked at me, oh, gosh, dang, I'm glad you're here. If you got five bucks, <laughs> and I, said, uh, I, I, I suppose, I'm standing here in the underwear, I suppose I got five bucks. Well, what, what do you need five bucks for, Paul? Well, I, these, these machines, you know, I, even, <laughs> I, 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 need, I, I need to buy candy bars and cigarettes, and even if I, but even if I get the five dollars, and I can't find my wallet, but even if, if I have the five dollars, where's the gas station attendant to get change? And then, ah, uh, <laughs> here, Dad, I know where your wallet is. So I go back and I get in his wallet, bring it out, and he feverishly hunts through it. Yeah, yeah, I gotta get, we got, he gets the five dollars out, and I take his wallet, put it back, and hide it in the extra secret space that he, where he knew he could find it later on. <laughs> and he said, because they're waiting for me out, out, out in the front, out by, by, by the gas pumps. Who's that? What? Well, friend Elsie. We've been driving up and down Tenth Avenue South all, you know, for I don't know how long, looking for candies uh, and, and cigarettes. And, and this is the only place they could possibly have them. They're waiting for me out in the car. <laughs> I've been sitting in the back seat. And it was, uh, oh, okay. Uh, and about this time he goes, yeah, they're just right out here. And then this guy who could not walk without that walker and took a long time to get anywhere with the walker proceeded to just step right over to my front door and look out the window and proclaim, they're gone. <laughs> ah, he knew this was going to happen. They were wait I I've been taking too long. I, they, 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 were, they were waiting for me and they left with, oh, no, I, I don't know. Dad, it's okay. Come with me. There's a, there's a cot in the back. 
Why don't you go over and lay in that cot up? And I'm sure everything will be fine. I'll look for the gas station. And then surprisingly, oh, okay. Off he went. That was the end of that little adventure. Uh, one thing most people don't know, Paul had a second wife. <laughs> he did not know what her name was. <laughs> and he didn't know how he ended up getting her. <laughs> but she was pushy and he didn't like her. <laughs> uh, there was a, well, one of the recurring themes, and this thing happened forever. I mean, ever since we first got Dad out there and it continued all the way through. There was less of it later on. Uh, was the he would always find himself on a bus that had no driver and had frosted windows and there were other passengers on the bus, nobody would talk to him. And it would take him various places. One of the places they frequently took him was the natatorium. Another place to take him was out east of Black Eagle. Another place was to the railroad terminal. Strangely, not a freight yard terminal, which he spent much of his life on, but the real terminal. And uh, he would take him there, and nobody would talk to him. But when it broke down, or not stuck, or another thing was right out here, just the corner, right out here, this uh, where your road comes up and you took Russell's driveway, right there. That was another spot. And when the bus would break down, either the battery went out or the one tire went out and got stuck in the ditch. Somehow, for some reason, everybody looked at Dad, and it was his job to save them. And there was always somebody very, very important on that bus that had to get where they were going, like a doctor, and then there was an operation, and they had to cover, or just some, some important person had to get someplace quick. And if they didn't get there quick, the cops would find them might find you blocking the road, he's gonna write Dad a ticket. Even though there's no bus driver, Dad's gonna get the ticket. And th this, this was a, a recurring theme, this happened a lot. Also, he did it, even though he never went to the terminals, he delivered a lot of freight. Uh, but that was one good thing. A lot of times I'd come in, all out of all odd hours of the night, what are we gonna do, I gotta get something done here, I need some, somebody, something's gotta happen. Uh, and he, well, I gotta get uh, 15,000 pounds of frozen food to, to, to Dutton. And I, oh, one thing I, I, I would fight with him when I didn't really understand what was going on the best way to wrangle him. And it would take forever. A lot of times, we gotta get this done. I, he, I, he didn't believe me for a second. We gotta get Lori in here. Lori, Lori would know. Lori hates everything. Because she could come in and go, oh, Dad, there's no, no, there's no fright. Oh, okay. Then you go to bed. You know, I can sit there and yell at him or, 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 or plead with him or anything all night. I don't know anything. But later on I discovered I could come up and go, he'd have to deliver this freight no matter where it was going. Say, Dad, they took away your driver's license. And you could tell that went right to the core of the man. Because he never forgot that. Every time I would tell him, you don't have a driver's license. I didn't have to convince him. Sometimes it would surprise him. Oh, that's right. You, know, you don't have a driver's license, Dad. Well, well, they expect me to get that up there. Well, you better not get it up there. Cop catches you. Your ass is in the, in the you're, you're in a sling. You know, I'll call your dispatcher. And that was usually the best, best resolution to that situation. Um, his body was in Springfield, but I can guarantee you 95% of the time he was in Great Falls. In one of those locations I mentioned. I have no idea why those locations are so important, but they are. He didn't even turn up at the house that much. You know, 1901 where we lived, once in a while, rarely. Usually it was, you'd be, you know, east of, east of Black Eagle a lot more often than that. Um, I want to touch on... I want to hold this up. Oh, uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Uh, this picture. I took this picture at a very important time. Uh, you've seen this one. There is a backstory on this one. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, 
it, 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 it took a while. One day, Mom pulled up in front of the uh, in front of the house, driving a team of horses to the buck. And he, she looked at Dad, and Dad knew it, I've got to get on the buckboard and go off with Sherry. Well, he, we started to go toward the buckboard, and he remembered, I've got to get Ernie's walker back to him. He wants me to give him his walker back when I'm through with it. This is a recurring thing, too. He, oh, he never got, never let loose of that. i got to get that back to him. So he turned around, grabbed the walker, went to get back on Ma's buckboard, and she had enough. <laughs> Down the road, her and the team of horses went. Okay, so he told me that story a couple, a couple days past. Well, then it turns out, he comes back, and after a night, he says, uh, Mom's come back. He said, but... She told me she's going to come for me again. And it's going to be in like four days. I forget, she had an exact time. It's going to be in four days. But she's not going to have time to eat. She's going to, she asked me to get her a hamburger. Have to have a hamburger for Sherry when she comes and gets me. In four days. So, oh, okay, Paul. And he usually let go of stuff like this. He'd come up with these things next day. Oh, what? No. Next day, he comes up. What day is it? Oh, and I'd have to tell him. Well, that means in three days, we've got to get a hamburger. <laughs> Next day, what day is it? Two days to the hamburger. Next day, what day is it? He's not letting this go. What day is it? One day, Paul, tomorrow it's going to happen. Got to get the hamburger tomorrow. Sure enough, the next day came around, he hadn't let go of it. And so me and, me and Paul, and I think Lori, you he went with me. I put Paul in the car. We went down to Carl's Jr. And I got a two for one. Uh, and I ate one of them, wrapped up the other one. Came home, got Paul in his electric chair. The time was ticking down. Okay, got him his hamburger, put it on a plate. Put it on the table in front of him. When Ma's here, the hamburger's here, you're out of here. Just like when he waits for a special edition of Price is Right. <laughs> he, he would wait and he would wait and wait patiently and when it was 10 minutes until it was time it was going to happen, <laughs> he'd fall asleep. And that's what he did with mom too. So I let him sleep. 